for cramming a lot of information into one slide, but um, it's basically a matrix. And so across the top, towards the right, where you see where work takes place, we've, we've sort of alluded to this idea of a bell curve. You know, you all may remember that from math class of, you know, a lot of stuff in the middle and then a little bit of stuff on either end, not to oversimplify it. But, but I think this is what organizations are discovering is probably pretty realistic in terms of who they have in the organization, the types of roles that they have, and that those roles and their job functions, the way they work, can help that organization figure out who might benefit from which kind of strategy. Because we're seeing this, this distribution of strategy as well, is there are those employees by who by the nature of their jobs, because they primarily work alone, this is very true for me, because I spend a lot of my time writing and, and keeping up with what's going on in the world in terms of trends and you know, papers other people have written. I write blog posts. I create content. I have lots of discussions with clients. But obviously, during the pandemic, those, those conversations have been on the phone or, or using Teams or Zoom. So it hasn't required me to go anywhere, which has been a good thing, given what we're all going through. So... There are those small percentage of folks inside the organization that that end of the bell curve that can certainly work from home most of the time because their jobs are designed to or, or in such a way that that makes sense. The other end of the spectrum, the other end of the bell curve are those people who probably have to be in the office because of the nature of their work. Um, I'll give you a simple example in in All Steel's headquarters in Iowa. Um, we have a model shop. We use it to build prototypes when we're doing product development. We use it to test sort of physical connectivity and the way the parts go together and things like that. The, the, two, the two gentlemen who are our model shop workers have to do their jobs in the model shop. They can't do that from home. They can't do that anywhere else in the building. They have to be in the model shop to do what they do because that's where all the equipment and the, and the parts and pieces are, right? So there are other folks that have jobs like that where they're reliant on things that are that are in the office location. This could be people associated with the factory or they could be people whose jobs require them because of a government contract to, to do their work on site for security reasons. So there's a whole, again, a whole small percentage of folks that need to be in the office. And so that's why this bell curve is what it is. And so the big middle is people who could theoretically come and go. And I think that's sort of the hardest part for, for organizations to get their head around because like, how will we know? And there are old biases that, that have been mentioned earlier about, you know, how will we know they're working if we can't see them? Which to me implies a level of distrust that's sort of, distur dis you know, discouraging. Um, I like to assume positive intent. I like to believe in a sociological principle called 95-5, which says 95% of the population is going to do the right thing, especially if they feel connected to the organization. It's only maybe 5% of the population that's sort of the criminal element that might abuse the privilege or take advantage of the situation. So if you buy into that idea that, that generally people will, will do the right thing, then we should be more trusting that, that folks, especially because we're giving them more autonomy, will sort of also take on additional responsibility to do the things they need to do with their colleagues. So, so that's the idea of the part across the top where it says where work takes place. Down the left side, you see these five categories of, of types of work. And this came from um, a gentleman that I worked with at Sun Microsystems who really thought a lot about this. He was one of the very first workplace strategists in the world. And he's since given it an amount of thought and, and basically suggests that if you simplify patterns of work down to a generalizable set, it's these five things. People are doing some portion of solo heads down work, they may have to work with certain, again, specialized equipment or materials that are only found in certain locations. Um, and then the last three are sort of forms of collaboration. The informal stuff is the social connection, you know, the seeing each other in the hallway, having lunch with a colleague, um, you know, talking over the, over the coffee machine, you know, those sorts of soft touches, what are called weak connections at times that are, that are basically helping us to build rapport to get to know each other, to get to know how what each other's background and expertise is. That's that's those are all really powerful things. 
we tended over the last several decades to, to not value, value those very much, but they're really, really super important. Um, the second type of collaboration is coordination. And by that, we mean those things that are more procedural, um, you know, getting up to speed on where we are in a certain situation. We're not necessarily trying to solve anything. We're trying to just share where we're at with something and update each other on something. And the, the notion here is that that coordination doesn't necessarily have to be face to face and doesn't necessarily have to be live. Um, but the third, the third kind of collaboration, the one on the bottom, and you can use other words for this if you want, but it's the innovation activities. It's, it's the ideation things. It's the things we do where we're brainstorming, where we might have filled the whole room with whiteboards and written all sorts of stuff on it because we're trying to kind of work out how these things are related and what we're going to think about here and whether that relates to this thing over there. And it's, it's, it's all that stuff that's sort of the really juicy, you know, interaction collaboration where we have to come up with something that didn't exist before. How are we going to solve this problem? What is it that we need to do to bring this product to market? What are all the good ideas everybody in the room has, right? So those kinds of activities are incredibly important and are probably the most important thing that, that organizations want to make sure they don't do poorly on. And those things have been really hard to do when we're all working remotely. So if you sort of understand what I've been doing with these colored bars um, that, that sort of form the matrix. What I was really just trying to do, and it's crude, please make, forgive me, I'm not a graphic designer. Um, it's sort of a question of where's the most potent place for that to happen. So you can see that there's sort of this correlation between working from home and doing heads down work. That, that that's the main, again, rationales for, for those folks that probably are good at that and that's appropriate given their their job work um it's you also see it over here and under resident because they've already got to be in the office because of the specialized equipment material category right that's why they're they need to be there so they're also going to do their heads down work there because they need to be in the office when it comes to social connection we're saying again the same thing with residents because they're already there that is where that's going to happen naturally um, for the hybrid and plus workers, many people probably want to come to the office because that's the place where it's easiest to see other people. That's that's the natural gathering place. We've relied on the office for years to do that for us. But the reason I put this other sort of lighter color behind, you know, under remote home is because we have to make sure that the people who aren't in the office on a regular basis are still made to feel as though they're a, a member of the organization. We do not want to kind of treat them as second class citizens or out of mind. So we have to still focus on the importance of those social connections, even when folks are remote. And that's something we've not necessarily spent much time and effort thinking about as organizations, but need to do that in the future so that we don't lose those people. Then when it comes to coordination, as I said, those don't necessarily have to happen in the office. They can be, you know, a Teams call like this one. And then finally, as you can see here, we're also saying that this ideation, collaboration, development, innovation thing, the office is, again, the best possible place for that to happen. But if we do end up needing some of those remote employees to join the call, we've got to try to make that experience between those two things as equitable as possible. So I hope this might be something you could use for, your, for yourselves and for your, your clients to help them kind of parse this out a little bit more so it doesn't seem like this ambiguous mush of, of, my God, we could be doing anything, how do we make sense of it? I think you can think about the nature of the work and um, the particular activities and where they are best done. And so it helps us to determine that the office, even though this is a presentation about working remotely and working from home, the office is really good at social connection and at ideation. And we should think about what that also means for office design. But back to really the whole point of this discussion, which is working from home. And so part of the reason we started here, though, is to, is to help organizations feel comfortable and informed as though they understand why some people might be great candidates for that and, and who might not be, um, so that there's clarity around what, you know, sort of what category we're putting people into or, or what we might expect from their behaviors and preferences. Now, you know as well as I do, everybody's home life is completely different. They have got very different situations. I live alone. That's very different than a family of, you know, six plus an extended 
you know, elder care situation or whatever it might be, right? So all that sort of has to be hopefully part of the thought process as well is, is there are going to be those people who love the ritual of coming to the office and love the sort of discipline of coming to the office as a way to kind of compartmentalize. But, you know, one of the things that we believe in is is let there be some variety because life is like that and rigid categories with with no room in them for consideration of people's situations aren't aren't really going to do much for the for the connection people feel with their organization or the commitment they have or the level of engagement they have with the organization those things can undermine it so um i hope that helps a little bit I see some value in in the way we've kind of describe this. Again, forgive the lack of good graphic design skills, but what we want to try to do now is maybe just ask you all a question around where you see things going. So I'm going to stop sharing, or I guess so I, I think, I think it's a, actually- We have a poll for you all. So you'll get a quick cue card on your screen. Just open that cue card. It will open up a question uh, with a few options. So can we have the poll please? And let me know if I need to stop sharing for that to work. So you would see a poll question in front of you. Uh, the question is, I'll read that question for all of you. Uh, what are your clients most concerned about getting back to office? And then you have options to select your response. Is it about people? Is it about space? Is it about technology? Or is it all of these three things? So you can select your appropriate answer. Uh, I hope you all are getting that uh, poll in front of your screen. Please select your appropriate response and press the submit button. OK, I think uh, everybody would have put their responses by now. So can we have poll results? Gaurav, can you tell me what the answers are? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see them. So the answers were uh, first being people. So reestablishing connections and culture, work processes and protocols developing new expectations about presence. The second was about space, changes to the office to find savings or better match work processes, setting up a home office mm -hmm. program or exploring co-working, flex spaces, etc. Third was about technology, tools to support collaboration and knowledge sharing, integrated mm -hmm. safety, occupancy or utilization. And then the fourth option was all about all of the above. When people agree to people, space, technology, everything is uh, mm -hmm. important. So which ones got the most votes? Can we have the poll results, please? Kirish, can we have the poll result, please? OK, so we have just got poll results. Uh, so people part get 6% of the poll, Jan. Space part get 10% of the poll. Technology part gets 13% of the poll. And 70% mm -hmm. people have to say that all of the all three. Of the That's probably pretty predictable because it does seem as though every organization realizes that they have to focus on all three. 
and that they work well together. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do before we before we go to the next slide is is talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that, that organizations have been grappling with, and this is back to this idea of of um, sort of putting people in these categories, but also feeling as though they're they're uncertain as to whether it's going to work well, you know. And and I think ultimately that is what organizations care about that whatever strategy they they come up with, they really want it to be the best strategy, right? That it's optimal for worker effectiveness, for that social connection and feeling bonds with each other, that the technology supports it well, et cetera. And one of the things that I think we could be talking about, but haven't really been talking about is coming from my same friend who used to be at Sun Microsystems, which is about this notion of agreements. His idea is that teams need to sort of make sure they're having conversations with each other on their teams about how they're going to work if some people aren't coming in as often as others. Like, why? when would we come in? Do we come in, do again, we agree that we need to come in for social connection and for ideation, collaboration, development, and that's when we really should come to the office, but we can agree about when we would stay home to do other things and to do our focused, down, our focused heads down work. And so how do we make sure we kind of can tell each other when we're available. I mean, you've had to, you, everybody on the call has had to sort of work some of this out in a, you know, in over the last several, 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 several months. How do you sort of put up a do not disturb sign or open for business sign? Um, when do we get together? How's that going to work? What platforms are we using? Do we need a new technology to do something? You know, all those kinds of questions should be something the team might be explicit about discussing so that they've worked some of those things out in advance and don't spend the next nine months trying to figure it out. You know, so his thing is get ahead of the game by having those conversations with each other and, and kind of getting agreements in place. Like, how are we going to do X? What platform are we using to do Y? Are we using the same names when we name files and put them on our cloud site? You know, all those sorts of things. So I imagine you've worked through a lot of that already. But we could encourage our clients to do the same thing because they may not realize how time saving and good feeling that would be. Because if we do sort of work those things out in advance, we sort of have set expectations and we can start to, to work together more smoothly. So what I wanted to do with the, the few minutes we have left is, is just show you a few more slides of some of the things we're doing with a, one client in particular where they are sort of using this kind of a model and realizing that they probably don't need as many workstations as they used to. They probably need more collaboration spaces as a, as a ratio of what they're doing in the office. So one of the things we're doing with one of our clients is taking what they've done in a particular typical layout of theirs of workstation clusters and with the theory of lifting them out and replacing them with collaboration spaces. So if they find that the ratio of individual seats to collaboration spaces isn't quite right, they think they're going to need fewer workstations, you know, individual seats and way more collaboration. How can they make subtle changes to the office to, to sort of fix the mix, if you will? So we have, as you see here, some modules are 12 feet wide, some are 27 feet wide. And then we showed them a series of options to replace those 12 feet wide solo seats with a series of spaces that could be good for two to four person meetings in this case. And then we showed them another one. Um, so you hear it, you see it sort of in the middle of having come out of floor plan and been replaced. You know, another combination again of, of just other places for three, four, five person meetings that have different sort of accessories, if you will, like the whiteboard in the middle and or standing versus sitting you know, a more formal posture versus a more casual posture, et cetera. Um, and then finally, another one where it could be that there's a much longer, um, uh, bigger meeting space in the middle, but there's opportunity too, because these things are mobile, to split them apart and to, to create two smaller spaces. And then with the wider ones, again, now there's, you know, a combination of spaces, some of which you've already seen, but we're sort of showing how arrangeable they are because of the nature of the products in this case. And then one one other option for, um, again, using some of the same componentry, but just layouting, laying it out differently. So one of the things that we would do is work with the team to determine which combinations of these things are better matched to the types of activities that team normally does. 
And I finally won more that, again, is some, somewhat familiar to you now that you've seen the things we're playing with. But just, again, the ability to create different combinations. And you're noticing, perhaps in the towards, sort of towards the upper right-hand corner, a, a monitor on an easel so that it's highly mobile. And um, that means I can bring the technology needed for a meeting, especially if we're going to have remote participants, to a situation where they can they can use that technology wherever it needs to to be. So, so that's kind of what we wanted to share with you today. This idea that there's there can be ways to more systematically think about who could be candidates from working for working from home, so that employees feel like there's a methodology that they can be comfortable with, they understand the logic behind it, and they're, they're feeling um, um, more organized, if you will, and more sure of their decision-making process in deciding how this is all going to play out. So working from home is one piece of a distributed workplace strategy, one piece of, a, of, a, of, a, of the way in which they can approach it, but now they can sort of see how the whole thing kind of goes together. And again, it will probably cause them to rethink their space like we did for this client and to think about technology, both in the types of things people need to do their work and the types of things the space needs to have in it to facilitate the sorts of collaboration that will probably be more um, often, more frequently in the office. So I want to we want to open it up for questions and um, have you know, have whatever dialogue you, you all want to have. Thanks, Jen. So uh, we are open for questions and you can put your questions in the chat box below and then we can we'll take those questions. But Jen, this was interesting and I have one uh, question for you. Firstly, mm -hmm. what is the biggest challenge that organizations are facing or will face while dealing with this COVID induced change? Well, when I we, think it's yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I think it's that it's sort mm -hmm. of like everything is changing sometimes, you know, in our lifetimes small things shift and we can sort of deal with small changes, but it feels today like almost everything is changing. We, you know, you saw it in the poll question. There's things around people. They have new expectations. Um, they want more freedom, having had some in this environment, if you consider it freedom to be able to work from home. Um, there's there's the, the things again about how the office may need to shift because the purpose of the office is shifting potentially to being a place for, for um, gathering, not necessarily just a place to house workstations. Um, the technologies are shifting because now we're, we've, we've been forced to become more digital, more, you know, in the cloud, more remote, more, you know, able to work um, without having to, to be face to face. Um, and yet, let me just emphasize, even with all that possibility of working remotely, there's a huge, huge value in face to face. And so, those organizations who do not want to give that up, I think their instincts are correct, is face-to-face -face matters. Face-to-face -face is, is just good for us as humans. It feeds our souls to be around other people. Connections help heal trauma. Connections help establish um, my commitment to my organization, my sense of belonging. Interdependence increases my sense of well-being. All those things are super important, and we, 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 we should not undermine the value of bringing people together. And so the office absolutely serves an important purpose, but boy, it just seems like, like I said, everything is, is on the table these days and it's really difficult to navigate all that. And I think that's why organizations are reading everything in sight and having conversations with you and with us and everybody else to try to figure this out. So I think the biggest challenge is it's a lot. It's everything seems to be in the air and it's difficult yeah. to navigate. Thank you. So we're just waiting for questions. No questions so far. Well, I don't, I'm not sure how to take that, but, <laughs> but either that means we covered the ground and, and you need to get on with your work. Um, but I hope it also means that we've given you some things that that help maybe make sense of some things or give you some some words or some ways to talk about it with your clients and um, you feel like there's a there's a bit of things here from which you can build some of the solutions you you're being asked to build for for your clients as well if there's questions we've got both our names up here so that you can reach out to us if there's yeah. examples of things that we could help with if you want to see 
lookbooks of some of the new types of applications organizations are moving towards as they think about those collaboration spaces, we can absolutely help you with examples of the things that we're seeing and the things that we're recommending um, in terms of those applications. So please let us know what we could do to help you. Yeah, no question. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan, for joining us this morning, uh, evening India time, and thank you, Moser team, for allowing us to share our two cents on this topic with you all. We look forward to have many such sessions in the near future. You can write back to me, uh, Rahul or Jabi, if you need any further information on this topic. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.